This episode may contain content of a graphic nature, including descriptions of physical and sexual violence against adults, children, and animals. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone. I'm Tanya. And I'm Talia. And we are Crimes and Consequences, a true crime podcast. Hi, Talia. Hi, Tanya. How are you? I'm doing splendid. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Sweet. I have a really exciting episode for everyone today. Oh, great. It is about one of Canada's most notorious serial killers named Clifford Olson. I don't know this. I don't know him. Oh, this story is jacked. So just wait till I tell you. But before I do... I would like to remind everyone to hit the subscribe or follow button on whatever app you're listening to, and I'll get to this. All right, do it. I need to warn everyone that there are some really graphic, gruesome parts to this story, so I may forget to say when it is. That's okay. They already know. I mean, it's expected with us. Yeah. So You're sicko. Yeah. (laughs) Just I'm just giving everyone a warning now. It's violence against children. Oh, fuck. Yeah, teenage children. Not that that makes it any better, but I'm just telling you. It's well, I mean, graphic. it sounds really bad, but the older they are, the less. I know. The less. I don't know how to what the word is. The less affected I am, but yeah. I'm still affected. But I know what you mean. The younger they are, the harder right. it is to right. hear because they're just innocent. The more young they are. So Clifford Olson was born on New Year's Day in 1940 in Vancouver, British Columbia, and his birth was featured in the local newspaper. Even though he wasn't the first birth of the day or even the second, and you know, all the good prizes go to the first births, back then they got gifts like silver spoons or cases of canned milk. Clifford's, (laughs) I know, canned milk, yes! I know. Clifford's parents still received a baby book and a gift from Cunningham drugstores to celebrate his New Year's Day birth at 10.10 p.m. Clifford was the firstborn and would be joined by two brothers and a sister. When he started elementary school, he would often get into fights with other boys and seemed to always have a vendetta against the other children for some small transgression. And the only way he could get even was by seeking the boys out and picking a fight. As a child, he stole things, small things, but this is where his life of crime began. He was known about the neighborhood as a petty thief and a con artist, and By the time he was 17, he had dropped out of school. Sounds like a real loser. Yeah. He soon found himself enrolled in the New Haven Borstal Correctional Center in Burnaby. And that was a juvenile center, I believe. And it was for breaking and entering. So his freedom out of high school didn't last long. He enrolled? Well, I'm being sarcastic. Oh, okay. Okay. (laughs) I'm taking some liberties with the English language. He served about nine months before he escaped by stealing a boat, and he was caught soon afterward, landing in a more secure correctional facility. They stole the boat? Yeah. Oh. I know. Pretty creative. During his stay, he escaped again by putting a little blood in his urine, and that earned him a trip to the prison hospital. The prison hospital security wasn't that tight, so he escaped and went home. His family pleaded with him to turn himself in and serve out the rest of his sentence. They were afraid that if the law didn't catch up with him, Clifford was likely to commit an even worse crime. So that's pretty bad when your family knows this about you. Clifford would spend a lot of his adult life in and out of prison. That is until he finally decided to become a serial killer and earn the moniker The Beast of British Columbia. The Beast of British Columbia. Yeah. Wow. Right? He's got to be nasty. He's nasty. It's nasty. I'm, I'm warning you guys. Before the murders, however, he was always cooking up some sort of scheme that would result in his escape, and he escaped prison a total of seven times. Well, it's Canada. (laughs) And sometimes their prisons are more like spas. Well, he found a way to get out of them several times. Every time he escaped, he was caught, and more time was added to his sentence, so I don't know what he was thinking. You'd think after like the fifth time, I'd be like, okay, I'm just going to give this up and serve out my time. But no, he kept trying. During one of his prison stays, he had to be put in protective custody for testifying against a man named Gary Marco. Gary was being tried for the rape and murder of a nine-year-old girl named Jenny Dove. 
Clifford testified against him, and Gary ended up getting sentenced to life in prison for Jenny's murder. And I don't know exactly what he testified to. Sounds like a jailhouse snitch. Right. That's what I'm thinking it was. In 1981, while out of prison, Clifford visited the old British Columbia Penitentiary that was closing to reminisce, apparently. While there with other sightseers, and unaware there was a Canada-wide warrant out for his arrest, Clifford checked out the old cell that he had spent four years and nine months in for theft, forgery, and false pretenses, and he was recognized by one of his former guards. That's really strange. <laughs> That's really, really Isn't that hilarious. Up. Yeah. Also in 1981, on May 15th, Clifford married his living girlfriend, Joan Hale. Soon after they were married, Joan gave birth to their son. Little did Joan know, Clifford had begun killing, even before he married her, and didn't stop after the marriage or after the birth of their son. His killing spree lasted only nine months, but he was quite prolific during those months, killing 11 children from the ages of 9 to 18. On August 12, 1981, Clifford was arrested while driving a rented car on Vancouver Island. I hate him. Right? I hate him already. Oh, me too. And... While he was in custody, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the RCMP, put him through some pretty intense interrogations where he was questioned about many of the unsolved murders that had occurred in the area. And that's when Clifford finally confessed to the 11 murders I'm going to tell you about. The first murder Clifford committed was the murder of a 12-year-old girl named Christine Ann Weller. On Christmas Day 1980, her body was found. Clifford drove her to an area of Richmond, British Columbia, where he strangled and stabbed her to death. Her autopsy showed that she had suffered 10 stab wounds to her chest and abdomen and two superficial slashes to her neck. The stab wounds had penetrated the right ventricle of her heart and four more penetrated her liver. She had been out riding her bike on her way back to where she was living when she disappeared on November 17, 1980. Oh, and they didn't find her till Christmas? I know, that's That's really sad. sad. Her disappearance was not initially determined to be suspicious by police. What? And I'm going to tell you a lot of these children that he killed, the police just think they're runaways. She's 12 years old on her bike. Mm-hmm. And she's gone. And it's not suspicious. No. That's 1980 for you. Right. 13-year-old Colin Dagno disappeared on April 15th, 1981, when she was going home after visiting with a friend. Clifford picked her up in Surrey and drove her to a remote area of South Surrey where he killed her by hammering her in the head. Oh. I know. With a hammer. Is he kidnapping them or luring them? He's luring them into his car. Okay. And I'll tell you a more in-depth story and a few victims from now. But yeah, he's getting them, enticing them into his car. Gotcha. The cause of death for Colleen was two fractures to the occipital region of her skull. Colleen was described as a shy, tiny girl, only about five feet tall. The RCMP initially treated her case as a runaway until Clifford confessed, and that's when her remains were found. So in declaring them runaways, they don't even really put forth any effort to no. try to find them. No, and a lot not of these really. parents are like, I know my child did not run away. And, you know, we've said it so many times. I'd be so pissed. I know. And, you know, we've had so many stories where parents have been like, I know my kid didn't run away. And the police are like, no, but, you know. It's very interesting to see how times have changed now. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're 12 years old and you're on your bike and you don't come home. The FBI will be involved yes. within days. Mm-hmm. Darren John Strood was picked up in New Westminster and driven to De Roche, where he was killed in the same manner as Colleen. He was killed by repeated hammer blows to his skull. The actual cause of death was skull fracture. 16-year-old Darren had only been in Vancouver for two days before Clifford viciously murdered him. He had been at a local mall on April 21st, 1981, when Clifford decided to make him his next victim, and his body was found two weeks later. So now he's going after males. Mm -hmm. Four days after his wedding to Joan, Clifford murdered Sandra Lynn Wolfsteiner. Sandra had been at a bus stop in Surrey after trying to get a ride home from her boyfriend's house. When she couldn't find a ride, she ended up at the bus stop. Clifford picked her up, and she was taken to a remote wooded area on Lake Chilliwack and killed when Clifford hit her several times in the head with a hammer. Damn! I know, just like he did with Darren and Colleen. Sandra's boyfriend's mother saw her get into Clifford's car. 
Very few skeletal remains were found, but her cause of death was found to be by head injury. You know, it, it seems like that's his favorite way to kill these children is by hammer. Is there sexual assault involved with this? You know, I believe yes. And I do talk about it a little bit later that even though I may not have described it, the police do end up believing that he sexually assaulted probably all of his victims. I would assume so. Mm-hmm. Some of them, though, they couldn't tell. Because skeletal remains, right. it sounds like. Right. And so it's only in his confession whether he told them about it or not, I would imagine. But yeah, I'm pretty sure he did because he's a gross fuck. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. 13-year-old Ada Anita Court was babysitting at her brother and sister-in-law's apartment and caught a bus to her boyfriend's house when she was done. She disappeared after that, and it's believed that she was picked up while walking on a road and taken to a remote area near Weaver Lake. She was also killed by repeated blows to her head by a hammer, and when her skeletal remains were found, her skull showed fracture lines. The apartment complex where her brother and sister-in-law lived happened to be the same apartment complex that Clifford had lived in with his parents when he was young. And his parents had worked there as caretakers of the complex. Hmm. There was a witness who believed he saw Clifford dumping Ada's body. And he was 52-year-old Jim Peranto from White Lake. He didn't report it? Right? Like, I wonder. I think I saw somebody dumping a body, but... Well, I'm going to keep that to myself because I tell you what, I would be so excited to call 911. Well, as I will also mention later, the families believe the RCMP really fucked this case up. And it was found out that Clifford was on their radar even after the first child disappeared. Wow. Yeah. On July 2nd, 1981, nine-year-old Simon Patrick James Partington ate his usual breakfast of cornflakes, got dressed in blue jeans and a blue t-shirt got on his bike with his new orange Snoopy book in a basket on his bike, and he rode to a friend's house. Simon never arrived and was killed in Richmond, British Columbia, after Clifford picked him up on his way to a friend's house. He was taken to a remote area of Richmond where Clifford gave him several bottles of beer and then, unlike the previous murders, strangled Simon to death. Up until Simon's death, I kind of mentioned this. The RCMP pretty much treated the other deaths like the kids were runaways, but Simon being only nine didn't fit the profile of like a typical teenage runaway. And the police had to look harder at his case and the others. Simon's abduction and death marked the first of five murders that Clifford would commit in July 1981. In one month? In one month. And he managed to go on a family vacation that month. What? Mm Mm-hmm. I'll tell you about that too. (laughs) Judy Cosma was picked up in New Westminster and taken to a remote area where she was stabbed to death on July 9th, 1981. She was only 14. When Clifford picked Judy up, he had another person in the car with him, 18-year-old Randy Ludlow. So Randy served as an eyewitness in Judy's last few hours alive. Randy told the police, quote, Between 11 and noon on July 9th, I was with Olson. We were driving toward downtown New Westminster. Olsen spotted a girl leaving a phone booth on Columbia Street in front of the Royal Columbian Hospital. He obviously knew her because he waved to her. She smiled and seemed to be happy to see him. How does he know this 14-year-old? I have no idea. He pulled over. She came across the street and talked to him. A week prior to Judy's death, Clifford had killed Simon. And two days before her death, he had been charged with indecent assault of a 16-year-old girl. So not only was he killing young people, he was also being a gross, probably, flasher. Perv. Perv, something. Judy had been on the way to Richmond to visit a friend and also apply for a job at Wendy's. She had met Clifford at McDonald's, where she also worked, and spoke to him about wanting to apply at Wendy's because she really wanted a second job. Like, she worked at this McDonald's, and he was a customer, and they started chit-chatting. Oh, so that's how they know each other. Yeah, that's how they know each other. Clifford told her he and Randy would be able to take her to that Wendy's. She was so excited to take the ride because... If she had to take the bus, it would have taken her forever since it went all through Vancouver to get there. While in the car, Clifford offered Judy and Randy the beers he always had in his car, and when they got to Richmond, they stopped to get more beer. And since they were early for Judy's interview at Wendy's, and it was also too early for her to meet her friend. When they all got back into the car, Judy sat in the front with Clifford while Randy sat in the back seat. Clifford offered Judy a job cleaning windows for $10 an hour. Wow, that, that's a it's good money chunk back of then. money. Yeah, it's, and she's like, oh, holy shit, right? They had bought a bottle of rum and some Coke from a liquor store, and Clifford had Randy mix up some rum and Cokes for all three of them. 
and he encouraged Judy to drink the cocktails. Randy says that while Clifford encouraged him to ply Judy with booze, he made a drink for her that was only Coke. I think Randy must have had some sixth sense about, you know, not wanting to get Judy drunk. He signaled to her that the drink was only Coke, and she said, whew, this is really strong. And Clifford nodded to Randy like, yeah, you did a good job. And this is before her job interview? Mm Mm-hmm. Why not? She's 16. I know. Clifford then gave Judy some little green pills and said, take these. These will straighten you out. They'll keep you from getting drunk. And later on, it would be found out that they were chloral hydrate. And What's they, that? It's like a drug that will uh, cause you to pass out. Oh. So they're not like to get you less drunk. They're actually to drug you so you'll pass out. She took them. Clifford parked his car in an underground garage at the apartment complex in which he lived. He went upstairs to his apartment to get something while Judy and Randy stayed in the car. And Randy said, quote, this was the only time I detected any anxiety on her part. She was nervous and upset. I put it down to the fact she was 16 years old. She'd been drinking and she was going to miss her job interview. She was crying and I wiped the tears from her eyes. Olson returned shortly and she seemed her old self again, end quote. So the pills hadn't taken effect yet? Not yet. After the visit to his apartment, Clifford dropped Randy off at a local mall. Later, he told Randy he had dropped Judy off in Richmond. The day after he killed Judy, Clifford went with Joan and his son to Knott's Berry Farm near Los Angeles on a family vacation until July 21st. So, do 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 I'm going to go on this wonderful family vacation with my wife and baby. After he just killed, I don't even know how many in July 3, 4? Um, two so far in July. Raymond Lawrence King Jr. was murdered on July 23rd, 1981, so just a couple days after he got back from his vacation. It's time to kill again. 15-year-old Lawrence was picked up at a bus stop near Westminster, and his body was thrown down an embankment. He was killed by blows to his head with a rock that Clifford used after the boy was unconscious. So Clifford kept booze in his car, like I said, and so he would get the teenagers to drink it, or he would get them to drink it and then give them those pills along with it. So... I believe he may have killed most of them when they were unconscious. I like to think that, just to make myself feel a little better. Right. But he did do that a lot. That seemed to be his M.O. Before he was killed, Raymond had biked to the Canada Manpower Youth Employment Center, where he met Clifford, and Raymond was looking for his first real job. How old is Clifford at this point? He's 41. He's 41-ish? Yes. 40, 41. Oh, man. Yeah. He's a gross old guy to these teenagers. Right. I mean, 40 seems pretty young to me, but <laughs> not to a 15-year-old. Yeah, he's a gross, gross old guy. Raymond went to the Manpower Employment Center often, so much so that, he, that the staff was getting to know him. Clifford promised him some work, very similar to what he did with Judy. And Raymond made the fateful decision to get into Clifford's car. Before he left with Clifford, Raymond had chained his bicycle behind the manpower building, and police used that as a clue that the boy didn't leave voluntarily. One of the police officers in New Westminster said that runaways usually do one of three things with their bikes before running away. They either sell it, use it to get away, or they leave it at home. So leaving it abandoned behind some building you were last seen at. Chained up. Chained up, right. Isn't something like a typical runaway would do. Well, yeah, you wouldn't chain it up because you don't care if someone takes it or not. Right. You're leaving it. Right, exactly. Clifford had used a rented car when he picked up Raymond. And always on the lookout for potential victims, Clifford had offered the rental clerk a job cleaning carpets at an apartment complex he said he owned. He didn't, by the way. He offered the clerk $16.60 an hour, which was obviously more than he made at the rental office. I mean, that's a lot of money. I mean, that's what people make now. Yeah. Thankfully for the clerk, he never took Clifford up on his offer. Does Clifford have a job? How is he doing all of this? Because this sounds like it takes some work. I mean, he's spending time during the day. During the day. Doing this. I do not believe he worked. No. I know. Because he's he's a a, fucking loser. Yeah, he's a gross fucking loser. Exactly. Clifford's fourth victim that July was Sigrund Charlotte Elizabeth Arnd, who was 18 at the time of her death. Sigrund was visiting the United States as a student and was originally from Weinheim, Germany. She was killed on July 24th, so just the day after Raymond was killed. Wow. I know. After Clifford spotted her at a pub and decided she was his next victim. He picked her up, 
and drove her to a remote area where he killed her with hammer blows to her head. After killing her, Clifford threw her body into a ditch that was filled with water. Her body was found partially buried in peat, like peat moss, only about 400 yards from where Simon's body had been found the day prior. So he kills Raymond the day prior, and that's also the same day Simon's body was found. So all these kids are turning. You can imagine how the police. I was wondering, like, some are skeletal, but some are popping up. Some are popping up. Right. They're found right away. It's a fucking mess for the police. Yeah. And then, obviously, when they're finding these bodies, they have to go back in time and look at all these cases they deemed were runaways and reevaluate that. Right. Oh, yeah. This was a huge story in British Columbia, even when it was happening. Sigrund wasn't added to Clifford's list of victims until he confessed to murdering her. Her parents back in Germany were told of her death and told the Vancouver son how they talked to her about never getting into strangers' cars or hitchhiking. Can you imagine how helpless they felt in oh, Germany? I know. I Your thought about in the them. United States. Yes, I thought about them writing this. I know. Just extreme helplessness, right? Sigrun left behind a diary where she talked about how she felt the friendliness and helpfulness of the local Canadians, which is probably what got her to lower her guard and get into Clifford's car in the first place, because Clifford is described as being like having a friendly face, being warm. So that's how he would trick these kids into thinking, you know, he was, he didn't look like a creeper necessarily. And Canadians are lovely people. Yes. Canadians are lovely people. Clifford's fifth victim in July 1981 was Terry Lynn Carson. She was murdered on July 27th, 1981, and was only 15 at the time. This is where it's going to get a little graphic, because Clifford describes her abduction and death in Peter Wellington's book, Predator. He describes their meeting. He pulled up alongside Terry, and at first she didn't notice his car. He wore a friendly smile, and his dress and the car were spotless. He asked her out the driver's side window where he headed, and she told him she was headed for Guilford, waiting for the bus to arrive. Clifford told her he was also heading to Guilford and for her to get in the car. You know, I'll give you a ride there. Oh, hell no. I know. Terry, hell no. Terry no did creepy hesitate. 40 something year old guy. I know. I know. We have the but advantage I, of all these years, right? Hindsight. Yeah, hindsight. I mean, when I was 15, I probably I maybe would have. I know. Maybe. Maybe. Terry hesitated, remembering her mother telling her never to hitchhike, but Clifford looked so nice and friendly. He had a warm smile and looked like he could just be the older brother or the dad of even one of her friends. As she hesitated, Clifford persuaded her to get in the car, and when she was inside, he offered her a job making three times the minimum wage at the time. Terry's interest was piqued. Her family always struggled to make ends meet. Clifford offered her alcohol, and when she told him she didn't want any more because she was starting to feel drunk, He told her about some pills in the glove box that he called wake-up pills. This is giving me anxiety. (sighs) I know. After taking them, Terry said she was still feeling drunk, so Clifford told her to take three more pills (gasps) and then to give him three pills because he also needed to stay awake. Of course, after she gave him three pills, he spit them into his hand when she wasn't looking, probably when she was washing them down with the vodka in orange juice he had supplied. You're, you're so right. The wisdom of being older. I just want to wish I could go back in time and tell her, don't do it. Don't Stop. do it, Terry. Don't do so it. Don't get sad. in this car. I know. I think of all the dumb shit I did and I really didn't even do that much dumb shit. I'm surprised I'm alive sometimes. I did so much dumb shit. I know. <laughs> That's why I'm on the fence. Would I have gone in that car and drank the vodka and pills? Probably. <laughs> Jeez, Tanya. Well, probably. You know I mean, me. probably. I'm just, yeah, I made I mean, some dumbass decisions, so. I'm not, I am so not judging her. I because... probably, if this happened at a party, I probably would have drank the OJ and took the pills. Oh, yeah. Definitely at a party. You know? And down easily so Uh, when i was 15 probably absolutely i would have when terry passed out clifford parked his car in a parking lot and it was abandoned he pulled her jeans and underwear down to her knees and then sodomized her roughly taking only a few seconds before he was finished after he was done he found a screwdriver in the (gasps) car he gripped it and put the point of it at the base of her head Mm -hmm. in his other hand was his trusty hammer. Oh, no, 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 nope. Yeah, it yeah, breaks yourself. Oh. And as he looked from one to the other, he raised the hammer and slammed it into the top of the screwdriver, driving the tool fully into Terry's skull. Thankfully, she never woke up. Oh, my 
God. But that didn't kill her. Oh. I know. She was still alive. At least unconscious? But Yes. Thankfully unconscious. Oh, my God. He's just a fucking monster. Mm -hmm. Right? His psyche's so dark. Oh. I... I got... I wanted to throw up reading this. Great. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome. He then dragged her body into a wooded area and placed her body in a creek face down. He stood on her shoulders to keep her head submerged in the creek in order to finally kill her. He slipped and fell into the water, though, and as he righted himself again on her shoulders, he put one foot on the back of her neck as air bubbles rose from her face. After the bubbles stopped, he kept his foot on her neck for a few more minutes, then finally left her in the watery grave. He burned her clothing and threw her purse and shoes into the Fraser River. I got no words. I know. 17-year-old Louise Simone Marie Evelyn Chartrand was murdered on July 30th, 1981. Described as a very tiny and young-looking girl for her age, Louise was hitchhiking to her night shift job as a waitress. Police believe Clifford picked her up and then drugged her. He drove with Louise in his car. He, and you're going to love this. He actually drove with Louise in his car to the RCMP station in Squamish to pick up a gun that had been taken from him. But he was turned away because the officer in charge of court exhibits wasn't in. So this had to be related to some other case, maybe assaulting, you know, that teenager I was telling you about. I'm not sure why his gun was at the police station. But he had a unconscious teenager, teenager in his car at yeah, the police station. At the police station. Well, I mean, look at how what he's gotten away with. I know. I, you right? Know, he's got all the courage in the world. He's mm-hmm. invincible. Right. After leaving the police station, Clifford drove on the killer highway. It was nicknamed this because that was due to the number of fatal accidents that happened on that roadway in the wintertime. Oh, damn. I know. I would not go down there. Killer highway? I take the back roads. Mm-mm, I know. <laughs> I take the killer back roads. Right. I mean, shit. Have you ever seen those videos of like whiteouts? And cars just ramming into each other, like, over and over. And Girl, we live freeway. in Michigan. I know. That, that happens every winter. I know. It's terrible. Clifford drove Louise to a gravel pit and then killed her with a hammer and buried her body in a shallow grave. So he confessed to some of these in complete detail and then others... That's what I'm thinking, yes. You not know? so much detail. Yeah, not so much detail. And even though I didn't mention it, we kind of talked about it, about Clifford sexually assaulting his victims, uh... You know, I really do believe that he did. And when he was finally arrested, as I told you about on August 12th, 1981, he had two female hitchhikers with him in the car. He had been under surveillance and was arrested when the RCMP realized the two girls were in danger because he was on the radar, like I told you, since the first victim, Christine. She was the one that at first it wasn't a suspicious disappearance. They thought that maybe she was a runaway. So he was on the radar ever since then. So when they realized that these two girls were in the car, they pulled him over and arrested him. Wow, they got lucky. Mm -hmm. Clifford was charged with 11 counts of first-degree murder, and he did plead guilty. He was sentenced to 11 consecutive life sentences and was classified as a very dangerous offender, one that would probably commit violent crimes again if he was ever released. Does that mean he gets like 20 years in Canada? I know. (laughs) I know, right? Just kidding. (laughs) 11 consecutive life sentences equals 20 years. years. 22 years. (laughs) Clifford cooperated in finding the bodies of his victims, these past 11 ones that I told you about. But only after he made a deal with the RCMP where he was paid $100,000, so $10,000 a body, he joked, and like he threw the last one in for free. Wow. Yeah. The hundred grand was given to him and it was put in a trust for the benefit of his wife, Joan, and his son. He was given that money for leading the police to, to these bodies. This I mean, really pissed off the public. Probably not the family, though. No. I mean, that's the only way they can... Get their love. Oh, no, the family was pissed too that he got money. Never mind. Yeah, but if he didn't get the money, he wouldn't have, they would have never found their loved one. I know. I know. That's the sad part. They just were really pissed. The public was pissed because he got this taxpayer money. There's only so much you can spend at the commissary. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) well, he didn't even get it. It went to a trust. I'm torn. I get it. I get both sides. Some people believe there were more than 11 victims. And who knows how many more Clifford would have told the police about. If he was offered maybe more money by the Mm -hmm. cops. The RCMP believe this is true. 
When RCMP Commissioner Don Wilson was asked by the Vancouver Sun if he believed that Clifford could tell them of more bodies, he said, quote, short answer was yes, unquote. The RCMP believed Clifford was responsible for many, many more murders. I mean, the month of July alone oh, was yeah. half our podcast. Right, exactly. There were murders at the time called the Highway Murders, and that was a string of unsolved sex murders in British Columbia's interior and the Alberta Rocky Mountains. Between 1972 and 1981, at least 14 young women were murdered on the Trans-Canada Yellowhead, or roads that fed into that highway over the Canadian Rockies. A 15th victim identified as a 12-year-old Native American girl named Monica Jack. Monica had been biking home on a country road when she went missing. Her body has never been found. All of these victims from these highway murders, these 15, fit the profile of Clifford's victims. They were all young, fresh-faced, with petite bodies. You know, he liked little, tiny, young girls. He liked boys, too. Yeah, he liked boys, too. It's believed all were hitchhiking, and many were sexually assaulted. The RCMP also think that Clifford has knowledge about the 17 women and six young girls who were murdered between the highway of... Kamloops and Banff? Don't know. One girl who went missing was 17-year-old Vera Jerky, who was from the small town of Yale, British Columbia. Yale is about 15 miles from a town called Hope. And Hope had a highway where Clifford liked to take many of his victims before he drove off the highway to remote areas where he killed his victims. So that's how they're connecting at least this one victim. Superintendent Larry Polk of the RCMP believes Verna's murder has all of the calling cards of a typical Clifford Olson murder victim. She was young, pretty, was hitchhiking in one of Clifford's favorite hunting grounds, and her belongings were found scattered around remote areas like he used to do with other victims' belongings. And this is in the 70s? No, Verna disappeared on May 2nd, 1981, so she was within the same time frame as when Clifford was killing girls and boys. Another murder victim that the RCMP believe Clifford may be responsible for is the death of Mary Ellen Jameson. She disappeared on August 7, 1981, only five days before Clifford was arrested. She was last seen on the Sunshine Coast, just north of Vancouver. She was hitchhiking on Highway 101 on Vancouver Island on her way home after having dinner with her boyfriend. There was no bus service where she was, so that's why she was hitchhiking, and because the only other way home was an expensive taxi ride, which would have cost about 15 bucks. When she didn't arrive home by 11 p.m., her family knew something was very wrong. Her body was found nine days later by three family friends about 12 miles from her home. The RCMP had searched the area before, but one family friend, and I thought this was kind of weird. So one family friend, 17-year-old Todd Redman, had a feeling that they missed something in their search. He dug at the gravel that was alongside the road, and even though there were no signs that the gravel had been disturbed, he was convinced she was there. She was found by him and, like I said, a couple other family friends. She was fully clothed with bruises around her neck where she had been strangled. The RCMP believed Clifford may have been responsible for her death because he strangled three of his victims, and he sometimes left his victims on back roads like he did, like where Mary Ellen was found. Now, that's interesting. I know. Strange. The family of Clifford's 11 admitted victims asked the government for an inquiry to find out more about the circumstances of their children's death. However, after more than three months, the coroner issued his report on June 4th, 1982, and it didn't disclose much more than the official RCMP reports. Parents of the victims said the RCMP was conducting a cover-up along with the federal solicitor general and the coroner. They felt really betrayed because they felt like the RCMP really bungled the whole investigation because many of the murders could have been prevented if the RCMP had done their job competently and the inquiry didn't even address these concerns that they had. They were also super pissed over what they called cash for corpses, Mm. which authorities justified by saying, quote, the recovery of the bodies from such isolated and hidden locations would have been virtually impossible without the active cooperation of Clifford Olson and the means used to gain cooperation were justified, end quote. I really feel like the police should have gotten the family's input and then done what they decided. Yeah. Considering he confessed and he was going to prison, it, they didn't have to have the bodies. The bodies were more for the families. Right, right. But that's just my thought. No, I, I would tend to agree. At least give them some sort of voice. 
Maybe that's what they're upset about. Five days before the inquiry was scheduled to be released, the victim's families went on the offensive and went to the press. They announced they were going to start legal action to get the $100,000 in blood money from the trust that was set up. They also demanded the resignation of many government officials, and they planned to sue Clifford, Joan, his wife, and the trustee of the fund that the money was in. They sued Clifford under the British Columbia's Family Compensation Act, which basically states that if the death of a person is caused by a wrongful act, and the act would have entitled the injured party to recover damages if death hadn't resulted, the person who caused damages is liable for the death. So it's very similar to the United States uh, civil action for wrongful death. Mm -hmm. Very much, yes. You're not penalized with prison, just financially. Just financially, yes. And the bar is much lower. Correct, correct. Six of the eight families that were in this suit, because not all 11 families participated in it, eight of them did, but six of them won their case against Clifford. But they couldn't touch the money in the trust because technically he had no money and he didn't have control of the trust, so the money couldn't be touched. It was his wife and child. Yeah, and it had a trustee. Yes. The two that didn't win their case had withdrawn their action. Each family won between thirteen and $20,000. That's it? That's it. Families tried again by filing a civil suit against Clifford, Joan, Clifford's defense attorney, and the lawyer who arranged for the trust to be created. The families again won, and the fund was finally ordered to be surrendered. But that decision was appealed, and it never happened. Interestingly, so this is the 80s, right? And this was before the Green River Killer was found out to be Gary Ridgway. Clifford was given immunity from prosecution from the state of Washington in return for him offering to reveal the whereabouts of bodies that had, you know, come up. And they thought maybe he had information about the Green River Killer. He had also admitted to having vacationed in Florida, Louisiana, Oregon, California, Illinois, and New York. So the RCMP thinks he could provide information in up to 23 more murders in those states. Before Gary Ridgway was identified, many U.S. jurisdictions believed Clifford had information that could identify him, but he refused to discuss the Green River killings unless he got a deal that would give him further immunity besides the Washington state one. But it was never realized after the Canadian prime minister at the time, Brian Mulroney, didn't want to negotiate further. There are several other murders connected to Clifford, and it makes me wonder if he seemed just like a convenient scapegoat because of the time frame of the murders, or did he really do these? Well, he certainly didn't start out when he was in his early 40s. Right. And then just go from zero to 60 in one second. And he doesn't seem like the type of person that go all over the U.S. I'm thinking he would stay yeah, in they, Canada. Yeah, the comfort zone. We mm-hmm. talked about the yeah, comfort zone. Yeah, because he, he really knew British Columbia well, especially the Vancouver area. So I would think, you know, it's easy for him to do it because he would know all of the, like, nooks and crannies where you could... Find some body. isolated areas, body. right, to Double kill. body. Mm-hmm, absolutely. He's not going to know that kind of shit in Florida. No, exactly. Clifford gave a personal profile of himself to authorities in British Columbia, but it didn't include why he committed the crimes he did. What do you mean a personal pro- profile? Oh, I'm going to tell you. Oh. He's going to tell you all kinds of shit about himself. Oh, okay. okay. He said, I'm not going to give you why I did it because that's more appropriate to be determined by, like, trained professionals, okay? Because you're a sick fuck. There you go. That's the answer. (laughs) But the reason he gave on making the profile was just to introduce himself. (laughs) You know, let you get to know him, okay? can't, okay? (laughs) Because he's the – because he has a huge ego. Oh, for sure. And he loves Clifford. For sure. Oh, for sure, right? All about me. All about me. Oh, it's so all about me. He starts off by saying, quote, I've taken the reader step by step through each and every case as to what happened in each murder. I used what took place during the murders and what was said between the children and myself. I tried to tell the facts as I recalled them and have added nothing of fiction to enhance them. Uh Uh-huh, sure. That's me. It's all (laughs) truthful. I also had the foresight to tape all the interviews in 1981 and 1982 with the three top psychiatrists of Vancouver, Calgary, and Toronto. These tapes are for my personal use and are only available to myself and my lawyer. What? His personal use? Yeah, for his own writing, because he's going to write a book to Leah, and for study purposes 
I have been currently conducting research and analyzing the lives and crimes of over 150 serial killers. Wait, this is Clifford? This is Clifford. I believe that there has never been an academic, university-level textbook that analyzes the lives and crimes of serial killers in the United States, Canada, or any other country. In my own personal study, I hope people will be able to get a clear understanding on violent behavior. Each serial killer has their own reasons as to why they murdered, but the reasons that led to the killing are not to be compared with each other as would be done in other fields of study. Once the facts are seen and provided by the killer himself, we will be able to fully understand why they killed. But I'm not going to provide you with my reasons why. He didn't, no. Then he went on to give reasons for why he pleaded guilty. And I thought you'd like to hear some of them because, you know, you're just going to want to throw up before you hear a couple of them. I can't wait. He's such a wonderful person. He's so kind. He cares. He he cares. He the family or some shit like that? Yes, he really does. Of course he does. He said, quote, I did not wish to put the parents of all the children to have to go through such emotional and physical strain and having to look at the photos of the remains and the state of their children's bodies were found. And excuse my English, but that's what he wrote, end quote. But he didn't give a fuck about them Thank you. when he was killing their children. Exactly. He said, quote, The mental and physical strain on my family and the families of the children would be extremely unbearable had I let the trial continue, end quote. And he gave a bunch of other bullshit similar reasons because he's, you know, just saving everybody the stress Thank and agony. Thank you so much, Clifford. Thank you so much. He does kind of express sorrow for these crimes, Mm -hmm. but I don't, I think he's just pontificating to make himself look better. Feigning being a human being with a soul. Yes. He's, you know, just so sorry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's sorry to his family and his children Mm -hmm. and blah, blah, blah. Now, here's the ridiculous stuff. Oh, now? Now. Yeah. As part of his profile, Clifford provided a list of some of his favorites. And I'll tell you what those favorites, what I mean by that. And also advice about women relationships and sex, which I found completely revolting. So, of course, I'm going to share it with you, Talia, and everyone else. Some of his favorite male actors. Oh, I'm so curious. (laughs) Charles Bronson, Jack Palance, Donald Sutherland, Sean Connery, Clint Eastwood. You know, all these manly men. Lee Majors, James Colburn, Marlon Brando, Chuck Norris, David Carradine, Arnold Schwarzenegger. (laughs) Some of his f- no, favorite just... female actors, Suzanne Somers, <laughs> Pia Zadora, oh. Heather Locklear, Angie Dickinson, Goldie Hawn, Sissy Spacek, Kim Bassinger, Cheryl Teagues, Cheryl Ladd, Cher, Sandra Dee, Bridget Bardot, Tina Turner, Farrah Fawcett, and Lindsay Wagner. His favorite comedy actors, um, Sherry Lewis and Lamb Chop. <laughs> What? <laughs> Rich Little, Buddy Hackett, Jay Leno, Gary Shandling, Johnny Carson, and Bill Cosby. Of course, Which is ironic. Yes. Oh, come on. So do you want to know what his ideal woman is? Do I? You do. Yeah, I do. I actually do. Okay. His ideal woman is sensitive, mm. to be treated with respect as an equal, a Christian woman, to have truly a good woman, you have to believe she is more precious than all the gems in the world. She has to be truthful and trustful and must be able to satisfy my needs. She has to be a very kind individual who is also sympathetic, tender, warm, gentle, tolerant, good-tempered, confident, very charitable, and a humanitarian, and most of all, the love of God. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> like, I this just, is I like just, a dating profile. I just, I need to slap him. I know. I just, I need to. Do you want to know what the best things about sex to him are? Oh, God, Tanya. You want me to say yes. Yes, I do. Yes, of course you do. Oh. Okay. (laughs) The whole joy of sex with love is that there are no rules. So as long as you enjoy it, and the choice is practically unlimited. Uninhibited partners will tell each other about their fantasies, parentheses, try free associating just before orgasm if you are shy, Mm. and parentheses. Really communicating partners look for them and put them on a menu unannounced. There is no more complete communication. Women probably differ sexually more than men. Never assume that you don't need to relearn for each person. Planning and thinking about sex to come is part of love, so so is lying together in complete luxury afterwards. You don't get high-quality sex without love and feedback. Feedback means that perfect mixture of stop-and-go, tough-and-tender, exertion, and affection. (laughs) I just vomited in my mouth. Yeah, I knew you would. There are only two guidelines in good sex. Don't do anything you don't really enjoy and find out your partner's needs and don't bucket them if you can help it. 
the bed is the right place to play all the games you ever will want to play. This is essential to a full, enterprising, and healthy, immature view of sex between committed people, and I think he may be met mature view of sex. Take off your shell along with your clothes. A woman's greatest asset after her beauty is her natural perfume. It comes from her hair, skin, breasts, armpits, and genitals. Okay, all right. D- okay, can we, are we done? <laughs> like, what, it, it, this is like Dr. Ruth. This is but gross. It, it's, what? Yeah. I mean, Clifford, the serial killer's guide to good sex. I know, this is right? Isn't fucking it stupid. horrifying? Isn't it horrifying? Especially considering I'm sure he raped his victims. And then he's saying, oh, you need to share everything, all your fantasies, and open. And I don't, you think he told his fucking wife of course what not, he'd like right? to do mm-hmm. what got him off right god okay <laughs> it's making me angry i know okay is he done can <sighs> we just move come on let's just move on okay he did end it with all rights reserved no part of this profile was serial killer by clifford robert olson may be reproduced <laughs> stored in a retrieval system or transmitted in any form or by any means <laughs> wow he views himself as so important. Right? Wow. Man, he's just too much. You know what? We need to cut and paste that, put that on our website, and he can fuck off with his copyright. <laughs> exactly. Clifford applied for early parole. Oh, no, no. Under the faint hope clause in Canadian law in August 1997, after serving 15 years of his sentence, he was denied. Prison psychiatrists told the chief justice of the province that Clifford has shown no remorse for the murders and has since claimed to have killed 80 to 200 people in total and that he would likely kill again if released. Wow. I know. Until 2010, Clifford reapplied several times for early parole and was repeatedly denied and he finally decided in 2010 to never appeal again. In March 2010, some shit went down again when the media found out that Clifford was receiving two government pensions that equaled about $1,100 Canadian a month. He was receiving Canada's old age security, which I took to mean like the U.S.'s social security, and the guaranteed income supplement, which is given to low income pensioners. No. No. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Low income prisoners or low income pensioners? Pensioners. Okay. Pensioners. Yes. So people who are of low income and that are on this old age security get a supplement. So does everybody in prison get this or why did he get <laughs> no, it? What is he got this? it because he qualified. Oh yeah. The money was being held in a trust for Clifford's benefit. On June 1st, 2010, the government moved to terminate his payment, saying that the mere fact he was receiving these benefits was outrageous and offensive. It is. It is. In September 2010, Clifford sent one of his old age security checks to author Peter Worthington, asking him to forward it to the prime minister at the time, Stephen Harper's re-election fund. (laughs) (laughs) If I was Stephen Harper, I would keep that on the down low. (laughs) And Peter Worthington's the one that wrote that book that I told you about, Predator. In September 2011, the media reported Clifford was suffering from terminal cancer. They never said what type of cancer it was, but they said it had metastasized, and he died on September 30th, 2011, at the age of 71. So that fucker is no longer around, thankfully. Thank God. Thank God. God. So that is my story about the disgusting beast of British Columbia. I absolutely despise him. I hate him. (sighs) I just want to spit on his grave. I like this story, by the way. Thank you. I hate Clifford, though. I do hate Clifford. Before we get into our other business, I want to tell everyone that this episode was recommended by one of our Patreon members, Brian B. So thank you, Brian, so much. He's from Canada, isn't he? Yes. Because he always recommends Canadian ones. Yes, he does. got some good ones. So thank you, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Also, before we get to our business, we have shout outs. Yes, we do. So if you're wondering what a shout out means, this is everyone that has joined our Patreon and or our new Apple subscribers. They're paid subscribers. Paid subscribers. And you can find out more information about that at patreon.com slash TNT Crimes, or you can go to our website. And they are additional episodes than our free weekly episodes. So they are bonus episodes. Every week we release a different episode to our paid subscribers. Mm -hmm. And they also get the public episode that you're listening to right now early, released early and ad free. Yes. And that is some of the benefits. Just one of many, 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 many many benefits. (laughs) So we would like to thank these wonderful people. Shay N., Lisa G., Kelsey B., Jackie F., Andrea M., Christina G., Maggie O., Jasmine R., Katie K., 
Alex C. Tanya. I think it's Tanya. T O N. Did you join us? I know. Tanya N. Abby H. William C. Haley T. A. Perry. Angie W. Christina F. Holly D. Maya M. Edward M. Brandy G. Bron T. E. Jennifer S. Randall B. Melissa K. Andrea B. Megan S. Sally S. Chrissy B. Nicole A. Amber J. Alisa V. Hannah A. Mary H. Brandy P. Damn, how many you got Ooh, going on I know, this I need list. to take another breath. Oh my God. Dustin L. Joellen M. Sarah. Alexis F. Harry D. And Harry also did those lovely keychains. So another shout out for you, Harry. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, he made us some homemade, beautifully Beautiful. carved wooden keychains. Carla O. And Lauren H. So Yay. thank you. Yay. We haven't done these in a few weeks, so... So thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone, again, for becoming one of our paid subscribers. You can find out more information about today's episode on our website. Crimesandconsequences.com. You can also find out information about our merch and, again, about joining Patreon. And you can see photos from the episode, et cetera, on our website. (laughs) Crimesandconsequences.com. You can find us on social media, on Facebook and Instagram. At Hardcore True Crime. And did I miss anything? Hmm. If you did, I didn't notice. All right. Well, if I did, it'll be in the next episode or the one previous. So until our next one. Yeah. Thank you all for taking the time to listen to us. And until next week, do not kill each other. Bye. Bye.